Hello, friends. Grace and peace to you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to this worship service for Harlow United Methodist Church and Oak Grove United Methodist Church. We are so pleased that you have chosen to join us today. This worship service is being recorded from Harlow United Methodist Church in Newport, North Carolina for worship on Sunday, May the 10th, which is the fifth Sunday of Easter. We hope this worship service finds you safe and well, and that the presence of the Holy Spirit is filling you with peace, hope, and joy, and new life during this Easter season. In preparation for our time of worship together, you may want to find a Bible. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 119. We will be reading verses 1 through 8 and 33 through 40. And then we will be reading in the New Testament from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. You may also want to light a candle as we do in our sanctuary when we are worshiping the Lord together so that we can be reminded of the presence of Christ among us. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. with me, please. Redeeming God, free our troubled hearts and reveal to us your marvelous light. Bring us to the place where we can know your Son and your love that dwells in him. Guide us by your truth and lead us to abundant life. In the name of Jesus, the Son, who glorifies you, the Father. Amen. Our lesson from the Psalms this day is from Psalm 119, verses 1 through 8 and 33 through 40. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep God's testimonies, who seek God with all their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in God's ways. You have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart when I learn your righteous ordinances. I will observe your statutes. Oh, forsake me not utterly. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise, which is for those who fear you. Turn away the reproach which I dread, for your ordinances are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. Amen. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? 
And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
times in our lives we face challenges and even life-changing events that turn our world upside down. For some, it is separation and divorce that challenges us to reassess our lives and to learn to live our lives in a new way. Sometimes we live our lives in a new way after the death of someone who is near to us. And we think about how we might live our lives while this person is gone. During the month of May, I often think of young people who are graduating from high school and college and university and the ways in which they will be living their lives living their lives in new places with new people and in new ways. When we recognize that we are going to have to live our lives in a new way, whether that's because of a good life-changing event or because it's because of a challenging life-changing event, the words that we need to hear are words of comfort and hope and encouragement. And these are the words that Jesus is speaking to his disciples as we read this text from the Gospel of John. Jesus and his disciples in this section of the book of John, they are in the upper room. They have just had their last supper together before Jesus is going to be arrested put on trial and crucified, although the disciples don't know that yet. All they know is that Jesus has told them that he will be leaving them soon, and where he is going, they will not be able to accompany him. Quite naturally, the disciples are surprised. They are shocked, they're confused, they're disoriented, they're feeling those beginning feelings of despair. They want to know, Jesus, where in the world are you going that we can't go with you? And if you say that we know the way to that place, we're not sure we know that either. And if you're leaving us, Jesus, how will we ever live without you? How can we continue to live and to continue the ministry that you have started without your presence with us? And so Jesus begins to answer their questions here in this text. What we read today is a very short portion of what we commonly call Jesus's farewell discourse. After Jesus has told his disciples that he will be departing from them soon, he has a goodbye conversation with them. In the Gospel of John, this goodbye conversation spans the chapters of the book of John from chapter 13 to chapter 17. In this conversation, Jesus offers the disciples words of hope and promise and encouragement. He tells them that he will come back to them someday. He promises that in the intervening time he will send the Holy Spirit. He gives them instructions on how to live and he offers a prayer for them in chapter 17. But the words that we want to focus on this day are his words of hope and encouragement when he tells them that where he is going, they will be able to follow because he himself is the way. As I was reading this text this week, those are the words that stuck in my brain, in my spirit, and in my heart. Jesus said, I am the way. And as I read this text, I read it in the way that I think that Jesus intended it to be, from the context of those words being words of hope and encouragement and promise to help the disciples know how to live the way to live 
while Jesus was away from them. So what did Jesus mean when he said, I am the way? When we consider them as words of hope and encouragement and promise, we may wonder what they mean for us as well. So first of all, Jesus says, I am going away, but you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said, Jesus, we don't know where you're going, so how in the world can we know the way to get there? And Jesus simply answered, I'm the way. Then he tells the disciples where he's going specifically. I'm not sure that the answer really helps them because Jesus says, I'm going to the Father. And the disciples are not sure how to get to the Father either. And so Jesus says, I am the way to the Father. Earlier in the Gospel of John in chapter 13, right before Jesus washes the disciples' feet, John, who is the author of the book of the Gospel of John, says that because Jesus knew he came from the Father and he knew he was going to the Father, he was able to wash the disciples' feet. So we know ahead of time where Jesus is going, but Jesus doesn't tell the disciples until we get to this particular conversation he's having with them. They want to know how to go to where Jesus is going. He says that he is the way to the Father. His life, his sacrificial death, and his resurrection unite us with the Father. But the disciples wanted to know the way to get to where Jesus was going. Often when we want to know how to get to a physical location, we use a GPS, a navigational system. It might be the navigational system in our car, or it might be the navigational system on our smartphone. We type in the address of our destination, our navigational system gives us a choice of routes, and we follow the leading of the navigational system. Back in the good old days, which were not that long ago, if we wanted to travel in a certain state or a certain region of our country, we would pull out a map, we would unfold it, we would study the roads, and we would map out the journey for ourselves. If we got lost, hopefully we kept a map in the car, and we unfolded it, looked at the map again, and redirected ourselves. But we used some kind of map. Yet another way to get to a destination would be to consult another person. That's probably the best way to get to where we want to go, is to consult a person who knows how to get there, who's been to that place, or maybe even will take us to that place. This weekend, I am traveling to see my parents for Mother's Day weekend. I'm gonna get in my car and drive. I won't need to put the address in my GPS. I won't need to use a map because I know the way to my parents' house. And you can be confident of this, that I know the way. And if you would like to know the way to my parents' house, I can give you the address. You could get it there that way, or I could simply put you in the car with me and take you there. That would be the best way for you to get to my parents' house, would be for me to show you the way to take you with me. If you want to know the way to my parents' house, I'm the best person to ask. And this is the way that Jesus is speaking of himself being the way to the Father. Just as I know confidently, unquestionably, the way to my parents' house, Jesus knows the way to his Father's house and to his Father. He knows the way to the Father that he wants to share 
with you and with me. He is the one that we follow. He even says in this text that he will come back again and take us to the place where he has prepared for us, the place where the Father is. This is what Jesus is saying. He's going to the Father. He knows the Father best. He and the Father are one. If you want to know the Father, if you want to see the Father, if you want to live with the Father forever, Jesus is the way. Jesus is not just a road map or a GPS that we follow to get to our Father God. He's our driver. He will take us with him to the place that he wants us to go, to be with the Father. So the answer to the question, how do we get to where Jesus is going? He's the way. He'll take us there. Another way that we can think of the way that Jesus is, Jesus is the way, is that sometimes the way is equivalent to instructions. Jesus teaches us how to live, and he embodies the instructions on the way to live our lives that will glorify God and show others the way. Often, instructions come in written form. Several years ago, I bought a set of three lamps from a home decoration store. The, boxes, the lamps came in a box and they needed to be assembled. I opened the box, I laid all the pieces on the floor to see what I had to work with, and I looked at the instructions. Now I know not everybody follows the instructions that come in a box with things that need to be assembled, but I'm not that confident. So I read the instructions thoroughly, I followed the instructions, and I successfully assembled the three lamps that came in pieces and parts in that box. And I'm still enjoying those lamps to this day. But there are other times that we need more than written instructions. We need a person who can walk us through the steps and help us to understand something or help us to do something. For example, in one of the churches that I served several years ago, we received an electronic defibrillator so that if someone in the church began to show signs of a heart attack or we knew that person was having a heart attack, we could use the defibrillator to help that person before emergency personnel were on the scene. This defibrillator came with written instructions. It also came with visual instructions. When you open the box and you look at the defibrillator, it had pictures on it that told you what to do step by step. In addition to that, when you turn the defibrillator on, it gave verbal instructions. It gave verbal commands of the steps to take, how to use the defibrillator. But even with all of that, many people in my congregation, including myself, felt uncomfortable using this apparatus. We didn't want to use it incorrectly or inappropriately or in a way that was gonna be hurtful rather than helpful. And so we invited an EMT to our church on a Sunday afternoon, and the EMT showed us how to use this defibrillator so that we knew how to use it appropriately and correctly and in a way that really would help someone. And so he really settled our hearts because after that we felt like we really knew that we could use this machine when it was needed. This is what Jesus does for us. He has left us instructions in his book, in his book, the Bible. And even if we have a red letter version of the Bible, we can be confident that the words that we read in the Gospels that are in the letters in red are the words of Jesus. His parables, his instructions, his words of comfort and grace. 
At the same time, we have four gospel accounts of Jesus' life. And so we can read the stories about how Jesus lived his life, how he forgave sins and healed people and saved them from the things that oppressed them. So we have both his verbal instructions and the model for, of his life so that we know how to live. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus gives us what he calls are the two greatest commandments. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. But in the Gospel of John, Jesus gives us a new command. And that command is love one another. Just as I have loved you, love one another. People will know that you are my disciples because of your love for one another. In my opinion, Jesus' new command in the book of John is more challenging than simply loving our neighbors as ourselves. It is one thing to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's quite another to look at the way that Jesus lived his life and love others the way that Jesus did. Loving as Jesus loved means loving sacrificially and humbly. Jesus not only gave us instructions, but he embodied those instructions. He showed us the way to live and to love in the way that he washed his disciples' feet, taking the form of a slave when he did that, and also through his sacrificial death for the atonement of our sins on the cross. The answer to the questions the disciples asked, how can we live our lives without you in our presence? Jesus said, I am the way. Live the way I have instructed you. Live the way I have modeled for you. I am the way. As I share with you that Jesus is the way and make an analogy of a road map or the driver of a car that can take us somewhere. And another analogy that he can give us the instructions on how to live. There's one piece missing. Jesus also offers us a way, the way, to be in relationship with him and with God our Father. And the way to be in relationship with Jesus and therefore with God is to believe in Jesus. Throughout the book of John, this is the theme, that we would come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that we would have life in his name. That's the purpose of the book of John, that we would believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus tells us that he is the Word of God who existed at the same time of God he was with God when the world was created and nothing was created that was created without him. He is the son of God who came into the world to share God's love with us, to save us and not to condemn us. He is the word of God that gives us abundant life here on earth and eternal life in heaven. But he says in this portion of his farewell speech that if we can't believe because of what he has said, we ought to at least consider the works of his hands, the works that he has performed on earth. And when we look at the book of John, we see that Jesus turned water into wine. He healed a blind man. He raised Lazarus from the dead when Lazarus had been dead for three days. And so the way to, believe, to have life and to have salvation is to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. Jesus is the way of salvation. He is the way to a relationship with God the Father. Jesus is the way. 
He invites us to believe in him. He invites us to follow him because he is the way to the Father. He himself gives us the instructions on how to live our lives in a way that glorifies God. The beauty and the gift of this statement from Jesus when he says, I am the way, is this. He is saying, here I am. I am the way to abundant life. I am the way to salvation. I am the way to the Father. I am the way to eternal life. Because Jesus is the way and no one comes to the Father except through him, that means that we have freedom. Once we believe in Jesus Christ, we don't have to follow any other rules to accomplish our salvation. There are no other rules to follow. There are no hoops to jump through, no points to earn to gain God's good graces because he's already given us his good graces. There's no other mediator that we need to gain assistance from because Jesus is the only mediator that we need. We simply believe in the identity and work of Jesus in order to receive salvation. It is a gift. Because you see, Jesus obeyed all the rules that were necessary because we could never obey all the rules. Jesus is the one who jumped through the hoops. Jesus is the one who earned our salvation because we could not earn it ourselves. We can trust that he is the mediator. As the Bible says in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. For our sins personally, but not for our sins only, but for the sins of the whole world. I find these words from Jesus saying that I am the way as a gift. They are words to me of hope and comfort because I know that I simply need to believe in Jesus and my salvation and my eternal life has been secured and not mine only, but also yours. And so I invite you to believe in Jesus this day. Praise God that he is the way. Amen. <laughs>
join me in prayer this day, please. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have given us as a gift. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy and for the gift of your son, Jesus, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. We thank you, Lord, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And that your salvation has been given, our salvation has been given to us as a pure gift of your love and grace. We thank you, Lord, on this day that has been designated as Mother's Day for our biological mothers and for our spiritual mothers and for all those women and even men who have nurtured us through our lives and who have shown us the way to live and the way to Jesus. We lift up to you this day all those who are infected with disease, all those who are suffering from injuries, and all those who have ongoing chronic illnesses. And we pray, Lord, that you would strengthen them in their minds and their bodies and their spirits. We pray, Lord, for all those who grieve the loss of someone dear to them this day, especially those who grieve the loss of children and those who grieve the loss of mothers. We pray, Lord, your special comfort to them this day. We pray, Lord, for all of the doctors and nurses and medical personnel who are working diligently in the medical field this day. And we pray for all of the researchers who are looking for cures and vaccines for illnesses that infect us. We pray, Lord, that you would hasten the day that there would be a vaccine for this global pandemic that we are dealing with these days. We pray, Lord, for all of the leaders of the world, that you would lead God and direct them with your Holy Spirit, that they would make appropriate decisions for all of the people that they govern. We pray for all those who are living in poverty, all those who have not enough of what they need, all those who are struggling to pay their bills because they don't have their jobs. We ask, Lord, that you would provide them for all that they need. And we pray, Lord, for all those who are facing their own death this day or in days to come, that you would lead and guide them, that you would give them comfort and peace. And we pray, Lord, that all those who do not yet know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior would come to know him. These things we pray in Jesus' name as he taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now the grace of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God and the comfort and empowerment of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen. Be at peace.